Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. I looked at some twin concordant and discordant studies, identical twin, and I was surprised to see, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised at how heritable obesity was. It was about 0.7. Um, and that's, I mean, when you see heritability of 0.7, that tells you something is very, very genetically predetermined. So even though 100 years ago, virtually none of us were obese, and today, let's just call it your lifetime incidence of obesity is 50%, tells you, and our genes haven't changed in 100 years. So clearly, our susceptibility for obesity has been with us for a great period of time, and it is highly, highly preserved. It's just that in the last, whatever, 40, 50 years, we now have matched or mirrored our genes to an environment that is allowing that trait to flourish. What do we know about the genes that, that regulate obesity? Or fatness, let's just talk about it through that lens, I suppose. Yeah, the meta-analysis of twin studies that I like to um, cite these days suggests an average heritability of 75 percent wow that's so even stronger yeah it's it's massive and and there's some debate about that yeah. you know i think but but directionally this is this is a really big deal it's very heritable yeah. yeah and a lot of things are very heritable i think that's one thing we're learning um but yeah so you have this this very high heritability of body mass index so um variation between individuals in body mass index, about 75% of those differences between people is explained by their genetics. That's what that implies. And um, if we look at other methods that have tried to figure out what are the genes that underlie this, what are the genetic differences, these are the genome-wide association studies that I think are particularly informative in this regard. They simply ask the question, if we look at the entire genome and we look at these representative genetic markers where different people have different uh, genetic code called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where in the genome, what markers correlate with differences in body mass index? Fortunately, body mass index is really easy to measure, so you can get really big sample sizes in these studies, which you need to get statistically significant results because you're looking at, I think like millions, I don't remember exactly how many, but you're looking at a lot of genomic markers. So you need tremendous statistical power to detect anything with, with a high level of confidence. So you have these studies, I think the latest is like 800,000 people. Hmm. Um, the leader of the pack is, is the height genome-wide association study. I think they have like 3 million. And now they've saturated the heritability. They've gotten all the information they can with that sample size out of what the common gene genetic variants are that correlate with differences in height. So I think with body mass index, we may, in the near future, we may saturate it as well. We may know what are all the common genetic differences that correlate with differences in, in body mass index. So um, essentially, so far, these studies have identified, I think, like 900 variants that differ. So what this suggests is that differences in body mass index between individuals are very complex, the, genetically very complex. They're determined by a lot of different genes with very small effect sizes. So you get this sorting of all these different genes and whatever combination you get, lucky or unlucky, determines whether you're, to a large degree, determines whether you are susceptible or not susceptible to obesity in a, in a fattening environment, is, is the way I would put it. And um, so they have various ways of looking at what these genes are doing, because, you know, that's one way you can use these genome-wide association studies that's particularly informative. You could say, what's the underlying biology that makes some people fatter and some people slimmer? And I want to talk a little bit about why this is such an important approach. One is that you're looking people, you're looking at people in their regular everyday context. 
This is not an artificial lab scenario. You're just looking at people living their lives and experiencing higher or lower weight, and you're saying what genes correlate with that. So it's very naturalistic. Second, it's very replicable. These studies are highly replicable. In other words, if you do three studies of this nature, you're going to tend to get similar results. So the methodology, it's one of the most rigorous, I would say, in the biological sciences that we have. And the and, third- And I think that, um, sorry, I'll let you finish because I was going to add something to that, but go ahead. Um, and the third one is that it's unusually objective as well. It has a higher level of built-in objectivity, resistance to bias compared to other types of investigation because it's not hypothesis driven. You're just looking across the whole genome and seeing what pops up. You're not saying, I'm going to focus on the connection between X biological process and Y outcome. You're just saying, I'm interested in Y outcome, what correlates with it, and let's see what biology pops up. Could be anything. We're just going to see. And so that really gives you a chance to, I think, check your thinking on what the underlying biology is in various traits and, and diseases. Yeah, and I think I think part of that comes from the strength of what ultimately makes genetic analyses like Mendelian randomization so powerful is the genes are randomly distributed. So that's what cleans out some of those biases is when you are looking at a million people for for whom the genes are randomly spread across them and you take an unbiased view of the sample and then you get those results over and over and over again. I think it becomes very powerful. And, and look, you know, if people are listening to us saying, God, what are these guys talking about? I mean, I think it's just important to understand the big picture here. The big picture here is a thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, to all intents and purposes, none of us were obese. But that still means directionally 50% of us at least had the genes that would allow us to become obese in an obesogenic environment. That's really all the, that's, that's really what we're explaining here is that there are a highly, highly heritable set of genes that will allow a subset of the population. And actually one of the things I'm just curious about your thoughts are teleologically, why is it 50%? Why isn't it a hundred percent, right? Like why is it that more people don't have that? W was this just a fluke of evolution? Was this, you know, you would, you would almost think that evolution would have wanted everybody to have those genes.